Yeah. Right, but he has overcome the world. You know, God has overcome right. the world. And so I think we have hope in that. Even people that struggle with things, mm-hmm. um, you know, God's overcome the world. And right. so so you can have victory in that. I think that's, that's the thing. A lot of people and a lot of preachers say, you know, if you come to Christ, everything's going to be easy. But it's almost the, the opposite. opposite because then yeah. you have another enemy in, in Satan, you know, that's against you. Right. So it's, uh, it is tough, though. But God's with you through those times. What is going on, guys? Dr. Jared Nelson, and welcome to the podcast of The Better Man with Dr. Jared Nelson, where you can never be perfect, but you can always be better. Today, we have a very, very special guest with us today, Mark Thompson. Yep. What's going on, man? Shoot, everything's fantastic. Awesome. Glad to be here. Thanks yeah, for glad having to have me. you. You have a lot of experience, uh, known you for a little mm-hmm. bit. Yep. And I wanted to tell you thank you. The reason we're here is because of you. Oh, well, thank you. You actually got us this place. Well, yeah, you know, that's how we kind of met. Uh, Several years ago, I think it was 2018, uh-huh. um, we met, um, and I'm a mortgage banker and uh, came in about a loan and did your house loan. You had excellent credit and just excellent. all the, all the great, top of the top of the line, top of the line, yeah. all the great credentials that you need <laughs> to right. buy a home. And not everybody has that, but you certainly did. And it That's was right. good experience there. And then time passed, and I got to reconnect with your dad and Bible class on Monday nights, and so. Next thing I know you, I see you in at church. And so Here we are. mainly I saw you in the gym and I was like, I think that looks familiar over there on the weigh machine. So I said, well, I said, man, you look familiar. What's up with you? That's right. And there you were. And so we kind of connected and got back, um, became friends again. So that's it was great. Right. Yeah. Well, talking about the gym. So I always start everybody off with a scenario. So you're, <laughs> you're in the gym, you're just chilling there. And a guy walks up to you and says, just like you do with me, you look so familiar. What do you say to him? Go along with it. So what well, do you do? Well, I don't have a filter, so I, I just respond. I either recognize you or I don't. Uh, but, you know, being in the public like we both are, we meet so many people, it's hard to remember names. I can right. recognize a face more, more than, a, than a name, so I just try to wing it the best I can. But, you know, most of the time people are very comfortable with you, you know, Saying, you know, I just remember seeing you, but I can't remember your name, so please help me out. Right. right. So if so, he asks you what you did, tell him, exa- kind of explain a little bit what you do and uh, how long you've been doing it. Oh, well, I'm a mortgage banker, and I work uh, for a bank, local bank uh, in, in gas in Southside area, and I just do home loans. I do really specialize in construction to perm lending, uh, did and still do a lot of purchase uh, home loans, 30-year fixed rate loans for people buying first time home buyers and all mm-hmm. that stuff. And, and then FHA and USDA and all those government programs and so forth. But I've been doing that for over 30 years. And, and uh, so it's just been a blessing to get to meet people like you and other people like today. I, um, I met a guy that's uh, retired air force Colonel and he oh, yeah. had a great story and um, super Christian guy. And just, man, he was just full of good stuff to talk about it. Just so been doing that. And, um, so yeah, it's good. So thirty years, you've had to see a lot of changes. I'm sure through the years and everything ups and oh, downs. Oh my and word! Everything. Yes, um, I just remember first starting out in the mid '80s. Twenty one percent. I made many twenty one percent interest rate on home loans. Twenty one percent. That's almost uh, hard it's, to it's horrible. Yeah. But the difference being, back in the mid '80s, average size cost of a home was one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars, and so. Mm-hmm. It's really not as painful as it sounds when you get like just maybe before COVID. Um, I know in our area, average size price home would be maybe two fifty or something like that, or and like a three bedroom, two bath ranch house for first time home buyers would be like one fifty nine or so. Those are all around three hundred now, and I'm not doing that many loans under four or five hundred thousand dollars. Just the cost is is phenomenal, but. You know, what was great before, you know, 2019, the interest rates were 3%, 4%. And, right. and so you could afford so much more money, uh, borrow so much more money, more house for, um, in that way. Now, housing costs are more, mortgage rates are, are higher. So it's really, really put a st- strain uh, on the economy. Yeah, so, and the housing shortage as well. Yeah. And so right now, that, you know, Nobody's willing to list their house right now because right. 
if you've got a 3% or 4% interest rate on your house, you're not going to go buy re- another house that you might think you want, might want to move up or move down in size and pay $100,000 more and pay double the interest rate. It just right. doesn't make sense to do that. So a lot of people are not buying that. They don't have their houses on the market for sale, but they are. Those people are building. And and so that's where we're at, doing more construction lending than, than anything, just because yeah, just- people are not listing their homes. Right. Well, why would you with a interest rate like that? I mean, it really doesn't make sense to do it. Even if you sell it, um, the cost effectiveness. Well, you know, doesn't matter. yeah, that's a good question. Life goes on. You have to live. Right. Uh, you have to move sometimes. And so I've just told people, look, just I'm going to qualify you for what you qualify for. And I'm not going to let you go over that on paper. So you're just going to have to tough it out for a couple of years and just have that mindset that, you know, this is not really my realistic goal here to be at 7% on a 30 year fixed rate loan owing $400,000. But I know based on uh, market conditions and what these experts are saying in a couple of years, there'll be another election cycle and there'll be uh, bond market changes and so forth. The rates should be uh, a point and a half or so better where it would make a logical to refinance. So right. just tough it out for a period of time. And just get on with it and buy that house or build that house that you want to and just know that you got that. You can do that at some point. Yeah, a lot of people do that, um, you know, buy, look at the price more than the interest rate because the interest rate is always fluctuating. But the cash or the sale price is really not going to change. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So it's really better to, even to, to look at the cash price more or the finance price and then you can refinance later on if you Absolutely. want to do that. You're right. Yeah. Absolutely. Good stuff. I want to talk about 30 versus 15 year. You're familiar with Dave Ramsey. I am. Yeah. So he's big on paying off debt. Get that debt out of yeah. your life and all that. Even the house. Yeah. It's like, get the house. So he, he is always goes for, we'll talk about more about Dave Ramsey in a second, but he goes for 15. He said, do 15, pay it off in eight, you know, wild stuff like that. 30 versus 15. What you got? So he's, I like Dave Ramsey, but he's not my all time favorite. Yeah. Based on this topic and the topic of not having any credit and so forth and, and him having a zero credit score. And that's, one of the most terrible experiences in my whole career was I had a Dave Ramsey guy in my office and he said, Mark, I'm, I'm retired. I'm disabled. And I've got four or $500,000 in the bank. And my financial guy told me to pay off everything. And, and it, so no credit cards, no, nothing, no revolving debt to keep, you know, a credit score turning. So he comes in to buy a house. It's $400,000. We'll say, I said, I got 200,000 to pay down. And, and I pull his credit up and it's perfect. He's never had a late payment in his whole life. Wow. Um, but he doesn't have a credit score because he hasn't used it in about a year. And I had to turn him down. Wow. That, was a, that was a horrible day. We did him a bank loan in house, of course. But, but as far as doing a, a good 30-year fixed rate or a 15-year fixed rate Fannie Mae product, I couldn't help him because he didn't have a score. So that way, I don't agree with that. Now, the 30 year versus 15 year depends on your age. As far as I'm concerned, if you're a mm-hmm. young guy, I would get a 30 year loan. And if you will just make one extra principal payment a year, uh, you can pay it off in 22 years and three months. So right. if you're in your thirties, that's what you should do. And just have the, um, flexibility of having that lower payment throughout the year. And that one time a year, when you get a tax refund or get a bonus at work or whatever, just pop it one good time. And, 20 years will go by and by then you'll be in your fifties and you'll be looking closer at retirement. Well, people say, dude, because of inflation, due to inflation and all that, it's almost better to do it over a longer period of time rather than sinking well, all is. that money into a house. Well, yeah, it is. I mean, everything's so expensive now, groceries mm-hmm. and gasoline and, and so forth. So yeah, having a, a flexible cash flow, you want to just look right now, you really want to be uh, on top of your game as far as your finances are concerned, because, uh, it's just been it's been a roller coaster ride for the last two years. But yeah. yeah. Now, if you're a 45 to 50 year old guy, probably a 15 year would be a better to get you a target for retirement and so forth, I think. But mm-hmm. if you're younger, get a 30 year loan, pay it off in 22 years and you'll be good to go. So what do you think about paying off a house early versus investing it rate of return? You know, because people can sink a lot of money into a house and like, I have a paid off house. But you're looking at four hundred grand versus if you invested that over a thirty year period could be millions. Economic conditions are, are different. It's a very good question. Right. Um, so up until this past year, 
uh, CD rates and so forth at the bank are like a quarter of a percent for a one, two year CD, a quarter of a percent. So uh, it would pay to uh, knock your mortgage out, which is at probably three or four percent. Makes more sense. Well, now uh, that's flipped. We've raised the, um, the Fed rate. I don't know what, 12 times over the last year and a half. So now CD rates are tied to that. And so you can get a five and a quarter um, CD rate and stocks have been pretty consistent. So it would make more sense now to get that pulled. If you can pay off that mortgage, knock it out and, and put that money in the bank or invest it. Mm -hmm. It just, it's flip-flopped in two years. It's amazing that that soon it's happened. Yeah, well, times are weird, especially They're you really had pre-COVID, then COVID, and now after effects of that oh, are man, pretty it's, wild. It's crazy. So what have you seen from that? What have you kind of learned all from that before COVID, during COVID, now after? What well, is kind of the outlook you need to have financially? Yeah, well, from a banking standpoint, I'll tell you, during COVID, I've never seen people go out and buy new cars, new boats, <laughs> um, yeah. new campers, and just, I don't know, just amazing to me. I, I don't know where all this money came from, but. It happened, and um, the housing market, people were buying houses, just paying, getting into these wars with uh, contracts on uh, price of a house and so forth. So yeah. it's just amazing. And, and uh, these rates going up is going to calm a lot of that down. I know that car sales are, are soft now, and campers and so forth are, are much softer. And, of course, housing is. So... You know, with inflation rate being three and now it's 3.6, it's still, we're maybe looking at November of another quarter hit on the uh, Fed rate. And possibly. we're in 2023, if anybody ever listens to this in the yes, future we're in or whatever. Yes, so November now, 2023, you're saying. But in 20, uh, 2020, um, you know, there was so much uncertainty, but yet people were just <laughs> spending money and doing stuff. I guess they thought they weren't going to go on vacation. Yeah, something. I wonder if there was a psychological component. You know, a lot of people go on spending sprees to make themselves feel better. A lot of depression and stuff during that time. You know, what if yep. it was a, an emotional almost yes, component? Yes, and, and the year or two leading up to COVID, um, I've never made so many loans in my life. It was just amazing. And the market was just going crazy. And then all of a sudden, the COVID lockdown started and that just changed everything. So yeah. this is where we are now is going through the, um, getting this economy back stable because it is just super inflated. I, know, I saw that Georgia, state of Georgia, just um, have stopped the tax on their diesel fuel and their car gasoline just to help their um, constituents there, you know, make it and go to the grocery store and stuff. I mean, one of the main components of this cost of goods right now is is the freight yeah the diesel fuel stuff so and we've gone from one extreme to the other with with energy we could get on that for another topic but yeah anyway that's where we're at with that well, it's wild we went through a lot i mean a lot of ups and downs and changes and especially people's finances and stuff um yeah i don't know where the money came from either it came out of nowhere it seems like <laughs> yeah i know and i'm i'm seeing people my age that are retiring and they're thinking that they're Kids and grandkids are going to come see them at the lake and they're going to all go swimming every uh, weekend and all this stuff. And, and they're just dumping lots of money into these lake properties. And, and, you know, I just know from life experience, having kids and grandkids, once your kids have kids, they're busy doing their thing, playing right. ball and traveling and dad's working all the time. So that's just a, in my, it's, doesn't turn out to be that rosy and peachy and you know you got mom and pop over there you know paying this monster mortgage in yeah. their retirement years and the kids aren't coming around so that's kind of a sad thing but it's reality and i see it happen a lot but, yeah well that's an interesting take you know and I, I think that's why i'm glad i have you here uh you are how old i'll be 65 in a couple of months congrats yep. medicare congrats. i just got my car <laughs> Welcome. Uh, and I'm 31. It's so, a new threshold for me. Yeah. Man. Yeah. But I'm 31. So it's good to see kind of, I don't even think about stuff like that. So oh, it's man. cool to see from your perspective, kind of all that. Oh, I've had a, I've had a condo at the beach. I've had a lake house and I'm like, man, I'm going to get this lake house. My youngest son, Ian was, um, you know, he was 
I don't know, 10 or 11, 12, I know Ian, good guy. Playing, good guy. playing little league ball. And he got into playing travel ball and all that stuff. So by this lake house and um, at Highland Lake and, and um, you know, my oldest son just got married. He's busy doing his thing. I thought, man, they'll be up here all the time. We'll have a great time. And life just got in the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was going up there on weekends cutting grass, and my kids were off doing whatever it is they do. Yeah. So moral of the story is when you got your children at home, you better love them yeah. and teach them well and, and do everything you possibly can with them because when they get driving a car and they see girls and <laughs> – and sports and all that stuff, you know, dad, he's, he's just, uh, he's a, he's, he's a goner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. Uh, for sure. I'm glad you had that perspective. You can tell, tell all about that. Mm. So, uh, we've talked about real estate. Let's talk about inflation a little bit. So you mentioned what the actual number is on inflation. I'm not as familiar, but I know we're in an inflationary period. Uh, has it, it's toned down, right. From what, what I've seen, right. Or is it about the same? What's the take? You know, I don't really go into shopping. I don't do that. My wife does all that, fortunately, and, and um blessed to have a wonderful wife. But um I do, I am a um director at a soup kitchen, local soup kitchen, and I see um that the food that we're getting at this soup kitchen from these these uh, grocery stores are items that people aren't buying because they can't afford it. Mm. Like like ribeye steaks and uh, um, crab legs and lobster and um, you name it, anything but uh, poultry items seems they they seem to buy it and but meat is just super expensive and right. certain types of coffees and different things we just have so much uh, all kind of sports drinks and stuff. There's just we were struggling to keep food. Um, to feed the people that we feed. And and now we're just, we're really blessed with a lot of food because these grocery stores have so much that people just aren't buying. Right. They're buying the necessities. They're buying the hamburger meat and they're buying, um, they're not buying the extra filet mignon and all that Rice stuff. They're meats. just not. And so um, <laughs> we're feeding those people at the soup kitchen pretty well right now because of that. It's just, it's awful. Um, gasoline is, is still high. And we were talking earlier about, you know, the cost of freight and everything. It's really affecting our economy. I've, I've made some, um, home loans to some truck driving companies, Mm -hmm. owners, and they're just, they're having to pay for a load of freight. Like instead of $1,200 for a a load, we'll say it's now 3,500, 5,000. So somebody has to absorb that cost and passing that on to the consumer. So everything at the grocery store, everything at Walmart and these different places. Well, going into economics amazing. a little bit, yeah. you know, that's the thing. If you pay, talk about vehicles, making vehicles, I heard they inflated the co- the wages of these people. Insane amounts of money. Well, yeah, like pay everybody $15 an hour. That was a big thing. What do you think <laughs> the cost of the good is going to do? It's got to go up to pay for the people. It's a leveling effect there. So I just bought a new car. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. It's my wife and so this is your last car, right? Your last <laughs> new car. But um, there was no negotiating. It, I ordered it. The price came in. That's what it was. If you want it, you got it. If you don't, the guy behind you is going to take it. Yeah. Uh, they don't keep cars on the lots anymore. They're just, they're, they just don't. So um, that part of is really changed in the automobile industry. But but you're right um, in saying that the, the, uh, hourly wage is going to be their negotiation. I don't know. Did they settle that today or, or not? I haven't that, seen that yet. strike yeah. with the auto right. owners union. Um, they're asking for a 47% hike and we're and they're And with all that being said, they're talking about pushing these enter these uh, EV cars and they're up. These auto owners are saying, please don't make such a drastic move in that. But if they do do that, that, these people are just voting themselves right out of a job because right. there's going to there's going to be so much of this. It's going to be robotic. They're not going to have the. They won't need well, not half the get, people they got. Not to get in too much in politics, mm-hmm. we'll go as far as you want to go. It's I'm fine. very I'm very surface level with sure, politics, honestly. But um, <clears throat> you know, you talked about a change of election. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, change of office from Democrat to Republican and stuff. Seeing stuff in real estate. Yes. 
uh, that trickles down into all economics. I don't think people really understand how important it's with investing, it's with the stock market, all that. It means a lot, the big change. We have the cleanest air in the world here. And when we were energy efficient in the Trump years, um, we had our we had enough fuel to take care of our own country. We were selling it to other countries. But that crude oil makes so many products in our country. I mean, it's unbelievable all that goes into rubber products, your roof, uh, some of the clothes that you wear. Just it's just unbelievable. Makeup, you name it. Right. Um, but just to stop just stop production and giving permits in like Enmore and some of those places that we had set up to go in that pipeline. It was just, we were set up it, that just got destroyed. It's just awful that that happened because um, now we're dependent on Russia and other people for uh, Venezuela and we're getting fuel from all over the place. I mean, it's crazy. We got more here than anywhere else in the world, mm-hmm. even Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's so, <clears throat> The other parts of the country are not going to have the emissions that we have. Look at China right now. They're we act like China's the greatest thing that ever happened, but they're if you look at their country, you can't see across the city for all the yeah. smog and cut it with a knife. So, yeah. And in Japan, pretty much the same way. Here, not so much. And I just don't understand. Maybe if they eased into that with a hybrid or something and mm-hmm. get their infrastructure set up, but. You know, I don't know. So it's it's just I'm talking to some uh, folks that are in the automobile industry, and they're just people just aren't buying them like they thought they would. They're just not. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people. I talked to a guy that sells used cars. He said the used car market is everybody's wanting to buy them right now yeah. because of that. Yeah. They're going all electric, and people just aren't ready for that yet. Yeah. So, what are you going to do when you have a, a new electric car and it's four years old and it's, the battery's fixing to go out, and you want to trade that car? What do you think you're going to get for it when the person behind you is going to have to put a battery in it at some point, which is, I don't know. I've heard all kinds of different numbers. Who knows? They could be 5,000 or 20,000. I've seen like a $27,000 yeah, quote. I've seen that's that too. For a battery in a car. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a new car. Oh, you can get some base right. new cars for that now. That's uh, right. It's amazing. I don't know. So I don't know where that's going to go, but I'm not, I'm not in that arena. I'll never own. Well, I want to say this. I've talked some about politics, not a ton, because I'm not really a very political person. I just kind of look at it uh, factually. But what people do has an impact that trickles down. I think a lot of people say, like, uh, close the pipeline. It's like, go green. We don't know. Think about all the jobs there. Think about how easy it is to get that and everything. Think about how reliant we are on it now. Like you said, eventually we can go green. Maybe we can slowly transition, but it's almost like they said we're going to stop it, even if we're ready or not. We're going to stop it and go green. Uh, how damaging is that? We're not going to. Know. Well, we're about to find out, I think. But yeah, they saw this as a window, um, because you've got Bernie Sanders and his crew really running the country, and they pretty much knew from they this was planned to go in and um, do as much of this green as they could, knowing that later it would slow down or stop or whatever so they're trying to do as much as they can but that pipeline for example would have been just an amazing thing not only it would have been a uh, um, very economical to move our fuel around that 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 oil to get you know processed and so forth it it was eco-friendly um so so now that we don't have that we got uh, tractor trailer trucks running up and down from Canada, all up and down through there, hauling it. So we're burning fuel, burning more emissions in the air. We're, we're, wow. It's just we're tripling the damage that we're trying to save by not doing the pipeline. It but just, isn't it's that just, what politics is, though, really, if you think about it? It's all about the look. <laughs> like you close the pipeline and it's like we're saving energy, but then by, or we're saving, you know, global emissions. But then yes. behind the scenes, you're tripling right. the emissions used because nobody knows about that. Like nobody really knows about no, that. They, they know we close the pipeline, we're safe. I know, but and that's politics, though. And the listen, whole. there's pipelines all over this country. There's yeah. thousands and thousands of miles of pipeline. They're everywhere. Just like when we had that when it was hacked, that Colonial pipeline from Virginia all the way down that. to Birmingham, right? Yeah. They um, there was a somebody was fishing on there, and they they uh, did a ransomware, a ransom. Uh, thing and shut their computers down and right. got in and so they had to pay up some coins to get out of that situation but 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's just crazy. It is. One thing I want to touch on, my dad has always told me ever since I was younger, you, I'm all about self-reliance, yeah. uh, cl- have, closing that pipeline. It's like you said, we depend on other countries. If there's any decision, if we can be reliant for ourselves and do something, that's, that's always the goal. That's financially. Um, and I've kind of took that throughout my whole life and it's, it's paid off pretty well, but always try to, if you know, sometimes you have to uh, set things, let people help you do other things, but as much as you can be relying on yourself and do what you need to do. Of course. But the whole thing with what you're talking about is America first. Right. And the party in office now and the rest of the world want to have a global economy. And I think that's bad for our country because we established ourselves. We broke away from the British and uh, the Europeans, how they they're because they're they're communist countries. They just are. They and you look at them, they're just they've got so many issues. We had a great democracy. We still do, but it's severely damaged, a little damaged. But (laughs) but it's it's America first. We take care of ourselves first. And then and look, we're the we're the most generous people in the world. We give out more stuff to, than anybody right. uh, not even close but if we don't take care of ourselves at home and that border situation oh my gosh that's insanity uh but it's there for they're doing it for a reason right and potential votes later or whatever it, and as and, and with a uh, asylum and so forth but anyway um we need to take care of ourselves first like yourself Self be self sufficient here, and we were pretty close to self sufficient. We had a booming economy. We had all the oil and gas prices were dollar eighty cents a gallon. People were saving money. Yeah, Every, the the most um, in the end of twenty twenty was the most um, savings of individual households ever recorded uh, in the United States, and now we're at the maximum household debt. And just credit card debt two in, years in just right? two and a half years. It, yes. yes. Uh people are having to use their credit cards to buy everyday stuff with groceries yeah. and so forth. So there's a big decision to make coming up. I mean, it's do you want to continue towards socialism or do you want to go back and be a, a capitalist uh republic like we are? Mm-hmm. And America first and take care of yourself, have your own oil, have your own food. I mean there's danger of China now buying up all of our um, um, farms in the Midwest right now. They're buying up hundreds of thousands of acres, mm-hmm. and they're just sitting on. They're disguising themselves as Americans, and they're and they're not. Mm. And their their intentions are to not do anything and and make us buy all of our produce and so forth from them. Mm-hmm. It's it's a, it's a scary thing. So we just need some. We need some godly men running our country. And right now we don't have any, there isn't any Mm. because the things that are done and said, um, a godly man would never say that or do what they're, or run this country like we are. And wow, it's just, it's, it's an amazing thing. I do like the Ramick guy. Is it Ramick? Is that his last name? Uh, Schwami. Schwami. Yeah. The Republican. Yes. Candidate, yes. yeah, that he, young guy, he, yeah. uh, business owner, and all that. He seems like yes. a very level headed oh, guy. A, he's he's a multimillionaire. He may be yeah. a billionaire. I'm not sure. I think he's a billionaire. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but he's not politician. You know, it's, he's it's not. Like, and he said, take off the teleprompters. You know, that's the kind of politics we need. Somebody that just speaks from the heart. Know. You know, know. that's he, what we need. He he is very well spoken, and and uh, so I don't think I don't know what he'll, will happen with him. Yeah. I know he's, he's still young. He's Buddhist. He's yeah. um, said he's not sure about what he would do to continue his relationship with um, Israel, which is God's chosen oh, people. See, I and didn't so know that. I don't do politics. Yeah, that's all right. I'm I'm in it. I'm, yeah, I'm all in. Yeah, sure. So um, that's why I'm cautious of that kind of. And he's been questioned on it, but not to any degree because he hadn't been in front of a camera enough. But these debates are coming up, and maybe that'll come up. Yeah. Next week, I think it's important to watch, but that's all we have. I mean, you know, people, yep. you know, all you can do is watch the debate, make the best decision, uh, and, and vote on your convictions. You know, right. that's all that's you can right. do. Um, uh, helping yourself before you help others. Uh, I, I have a story, you know, about times where I think I was asked to be generous and I said no, and I was kind of shamed for that. I'm not going to go into the details, 
But I think that's something as our country, I think that's something that's important. I think when you're strong, when you're financially sound, when you are, are operating out of a position of strength, mm-hmm. you can help people better. I think some people just want to give everything away. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's a really great thing. I don't think biblically we are supposed to give. We're supposed to do that, but we're also supposed to take care of our household, take care of our family and be financially mm-hmm. sound. Yep. And we're not, we're, we have a $32 trillion deficit. Right. Um, growing every day. We just have so many issues. Yeah. Um, so maybe the, Maybe something good to come of this next election. We'll have a change. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. So if you were to tell somebody today, most people that are listening are like 20, 30, 40 uh, years old. If you were to tell them, we talked about inflation, we talked about real estate, all these problems going on. What would be your outlook if you were, say, my age, 31 years old? What's the plan? If you're kind of starting out, you're looking to buy a house, you're looking to get stable and everything. What's kind of your advice to somebody around that age? Well, do your best to make good decisions um, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, get a skill that that will has actually has a future. There's so many people that's gone to college and and got degrees um, that are really not very helpful to yeah. a career, you know. So um, there's there's tons of jobs out there, as you know. So that's the ticket is, is getting a, a good, stable job. Housing will take care of itself and just. Um, you know, find you a good church and find you a good woman and, and just, um, you know, try to live a godly life. That's awesome. Well, income first. I think that's, it's get, income get the first. flow of it income is. It is. down. That's where a lot of mistakes are made in early marriages is, you know, the intentions are there that you fall in love with someone sure. and, and you're like, gosh, I just, I just want to be I want the white the picket fence. Time. I want the white picket fence. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. And then, and then the, and then you get married and then the money, situation is super tight and then you get into arguments and problems and then they just es- escalate and that. So the financially set up to, from the get go is will yield much more fruit. Well, the and man is the leader in that. I think is. you have to be extremely disciplined and lead that uh, right. relationship that way and have a woman that's willing to right. follow that. But I think the best way for a woman to see, Hey, I can follow him financially is to have it done yourself. Oh yeah. Have, have everything, have all your ducks in a row, have everything lined up it is. and do it yourself. Well, God made the man to be the leader of the household right. and the the wife is the helper. I mean, I'm just, it is what it is, but, yeah. um, so live in that way and being prepared for, um, marriage counseling for marriage and, mm-hmm. and just make good decisions on it. So you talked about the man being the leader of the household. Um, a lot of people would call that misogynistic. They would. That word. <laughs> they would. So, you know, biblically, we're both uh, Bible believers. We're going to get into that in a second, kind of your testimony, everything else. Um, what would you say to somebody that's that, you know, you said, you know, I married this woman. I'm taking care of her. Um, you know, I'm going to provide for her, lead her and all that. But I'm the man of the household. You know, right. the decisions we work together to make decisions. But I, right. I, I initiate those decisions. Right. Um, people would call you misogynistic if they called you that. What would you say to that? Well, PG, I know in, <laughs> in today's world, though, being a, I have interviewed people for mortgage loans all the time. And <clears throat> I will have to say this, um, that used to be the general rule that, that I dealt with men that were coming in buying house, and now it's women. Um, the wives are running the households. The guys are working and, but, but they just, they're more, they seem to be higher educated in most, yeah. a lot of cases. And yeah. so they're very well spoken and they take care of the business part of it and get it and so forth. And, uh, it's a, it's a good, most of the time it's very, very good. Uh, but in answer to your question, you know, I really don't know. I, I just try to, my wife is way smarter than I would ever be, hmm. but we discuss things, but you know, I run the household for sure. And well, for and, a woman, uh, I think it would take pressure off. Like if you yeah, decide yeah, yeah. I'm going to follow this man, I trust his leadership. You know, we're going right. to discuss things together, make decisions together, right. but he is the initiator of those decisions. Yeah. It takes the stress off. It's a team effort. And, and right. it's, it's for the common goal. It's not that the guy is any better than the woman. Right. They were, we're all equal in the sight of God. So, um, but that being said, somebody has to be the leader and God chose the man to be the leader of the, of the, of the family. In most cases, that's true. And I, I just feel like, um, I want to implement whatever, 
he says. And right. so, but in a lot of cases, not so much, but whatever works. And, and, um, you know, as long as, you know, I don't know, but it's hard to describe. I can't it fathom really is. it. I can't, cause I don't think you probably could either. Like I couldn't allow, like if I was in a relationship with a woman to her initiate everything and handle I, that's just not in me. I, me either. You know, me either. And it's not a control issue. It's because I care. That's and, right. And, I, and you care about that person. That's right. I understand how I want to lead things. I've seen failures with things. I've seen successes with mm-hmm. things. And because of that experience, now I want to lead that in the proper way. Yeah. Um, but how did we get here? How did we get here to where we talked about your generation, but the best generation was with, with World War Two. Would World you say? War II, yeah, the that was generation. the greatest generation there was, and I agree with that. Was, how did we get here to where men don't lead often as much, and a lot of women now? Oh, okay, there you go. That, you might have to say something for it to go to your. <laughs> that's the downfall. He, he held up a cell right phone. There. If anybody is online, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, just you know, I just remember growing up as a kid. We we rode bicycles, and we didn't. I grew up. We didn't have anything. We played with each other. We yeah. played sports, um, just went to school, loved each other. Um, and then the, you know, cell phones came into the play and then social media came into a big play and that's just consuming people's time. It's just eating them up. It's eating their time away. And you just lose living life. You lose yeah. reading. People don't read books anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they don't sit down at the kitchen table with their family and eat dinner because you go to a restaurant, you see people looking at their phones. I'm that thing is Satan right there, that phone. But it's a, I got to have it for work because that's how I talk to people on the phone. It's my cell phone. But sure. But anyway, growing up, man, it was just different times then. Moral, there were morals then. Um, seems like uh, families were more intact. I went to my grandmother's every Sunday after church yeah. and had dinner with everybody. There wasn't any computers. There wasn't any. I mean, that's just what we just what you did because there wasn't anything else to do. Well, just, you said so, loved each other. I yeah. think that's a big one. Satan, yeah. I think, uses, and I talked about this on the last episode. He's very insidious, sneaky about things. He's he not going to say, here's this. This is bad. Go yep. do this. He's going to disguise it all and kind of hide it and mm-hmm. distract you. And we have so many distractions going from your to my generation. We do. When I was in middle school, I created Facebook, I think eighth grade or something. And I could mm. even tell a difference then. I don't know if it's because of growing up, but just the just the nature of people, it just yep. seemed like they're more distracted, more self-centered, I think is a big one. Yeah, everybody's looking out for themselves. Um, I think they feel like they have to because, you know. Of how things well, well are everybody else is. Everybody and else is. It's like is. if nobody else looks out for me, I have to. Right. You know, so I have to look out for That's where being in, having a good church family yeah. is is amazing. I'm a type A. I'm very high strung. But people at work and people at church, they tell me, you're a different perf- person at work than you are at church. Because when I'm at church, I mean, I love, love is just pouring out of my skin. I love wow. it. I love being there, I love everything about it. I just feel in touch with the Lord there, feel close because all my friends are, uh, we want to be there. We don't just go because it's Sunday morning. We can't wait to get there. We go every Sunday morning, don't ever miss. Love it. Um, and, you know, dealing with the public, sometimes it's, it's difficult. And and um, and so you have a little bit of a chip every now and again, you know, and on your shoulder. So mm. um, it's just how it is. I mean, I'm not, I'm just a man, sure. I'm a sinner like everybody else. But anyway, just having, um, that is just comfort for me. It is. And you know, that's very, you know, enlightening for you to say that you enjoy being there. I think some people look at mm-hmm. church as a box to check off and all that, but to enjoy the presence and community of other people. Yep. But I think my generation, especially the one younger than me, being in community with people is not very looked highly upon as important. Really, it's all about technology. It's all mm. about one upping everything, being the best, being flashy, and all that more it's than true. actual true good it relationships. It is. I see that. I see that in. Um, I see that in uh, younger couples, and that mm-hmm. I, I really do see. Um, I mean, you can just look at Facebook and see everybody's one up in the other guy. Right. But I'm telling you. Um, relationships uh christian relationships are just amazing get in a life group or a or a small group and just 
meeting with people outside of church, Byron, in somebody's home and just discussing, you know, life problems, financial, sick people, whatever. Um, you develop a support mechanism, and that's more important than anything um, that you can do with them, like anything. And so um, it's just an opportunity to develop. Just you become so tight knit, like my life group, are there's, I don't know, there's 40 of us, I guess, and mm-hmm. we love each other like brothers and sisters, and we're really tight. We meet every, we do, we travel together. We go to Glacier. We go to I don't know, Yellowstone, all these different places because we want to be with each other. We love each other, and we all love the Lord, and right. it's just an awesome experience. It really is. Well, life groups, if people don't know, it's kind of like Sunday school in a way, yeah, but, so, but it's like a group yeah, of people all together, and people yeah. that aren't familiar with all that. Yep. So I kind of want to segue into your faith specifically. We just talked about church and all that. Let's talk about that. Your testimony. Uh, did you grow up in a Christian household? I grew up. I grew up in a Lutheran church okay. um, all my life. Um, um, and so um, from I got you know baptized when I was an infant and grew up and went through catechism and and completed confirmation and that's where you learn what you're studying about the bible martin luther um wrote a catechism for Mm -hmm. you know all the things you need to know to be a good christian and follow the follow the law and and uh love people and believe in jesus right Mm -hmm. and so uh yeah i got a good that's a great background the theology theologically they're wonderful that was a great thing um Grew up in the, my church, and um, um, people moved away, and people there got older, and so Debbie and I, my wife, were just looking for, um, you know, to be fed, really. So we, our son Ian was going to a, where we go to church now, and and we got went there to see him play music at a program or something, and fell in love with what we were hearing the Bible te- taught, right. You know, from the pulpit and in a wonderful way. Mm-hmm. And, um, so we, my wife and I both grew up in a church and we just kind of, kind of, I guess, rededicated ourselves and got, I got re I got baptized. I went to Israel with oh, the wow. church and, and we both got baptized, uh, in the Jordan river. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, that has so much meaning, but, um, just, you know, I guess our testimony would be um, we were just so hungry for the word and we, we weren't getting it. And, and then we went to somewhere else, not ever going anywhere else. And we right. found um, the word being preached in a, in a wonderful way and a loving way and, and um, how to spread that love to other people. Mm-hmm. And that's what God wants us to do. So now, I think that's a beautiful thing. You said the hungry for the word. I think people are. But I don't think some people know how to get there, know how to find a good place to go and all that. And it kind of takes some time for some people. I think that's our innate desire, though, that right. we, we feel there is a creator. Right. Like we, when we search, we try to fill it, that void with whatever. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, you know, but that call is there. And I think that's what that call is, that deep yearning to have God the mm-hmm. Father in your life. And I think, oh, yeah. uh, I think a lot of people look for that, but some people not, might not know, you know how to find it or even what they're feeling, yeah. what to look for. That was a false I had younger is just going to church on Sunday. And I didn't probably touch a Bible till I went back the next Sunday. Yeah. Well, now, um, I read the Bible every single day, every morning I go to work at six o'clock in the morning. I do a 30 minute Bible study every day. Um, and I, I try to stay active in a men's class, uh, on, during the week. And I go to church and do a, a, a Sunday school class there. But, Staying grounded in it keeps you, you know, wanting to learn more and more and more. Right. Uh, and that's where you want to be. And that's where you're going to grow as a Christian and, and get closer to the Lord. Um, you know, you if you believe in Jesus, you're, you're, you're in, you're, you're saved, but you can get closer to the Lord by knowing more about him and, and wanting to. Uh, and that's huge, especially when you have when you have a family or or whatever, that's a big deal. Is having your whole family involved in that because that keeps you close knit. Yeah, right, well, I think that's what God wants us to do. He wants yep. a relationship with us. It's not that we check off all these boxes and all that, mm-hmm. and do all this stuff, 
he wants a, a real mm-hmm. relationship with us. And uh, but sure. I think that's great. People that struggle maybe with daily Bible reading. You know, what would you say to those people, people that can't form a routine? How did you form a routine doing that every day? And how beneficial was it to you in your life? Yes, this is interesting. Sure. Um, I went to a discipleship class with my pastor at the church that I yeah. go to, and he taught me how to be a better Christian. And one of the things was, he said, Mark, you need to get up every morning before you go to work, hold your wife's hand, and you and her pray together. Now, for a a grown man to hold your wife's hand and pray with her, that takes courage yeah. initially to do that. Now it's just second nature for me, but um, to hold your wife's hand and pray every single day and you pray for each other, you pray for your family, you pray for the needs of other people, uh, your church and so forth. Um, that is a big start. Um, and then if you're involved at church or with a you know, a uh, small group, even if you're not in a church or you can go attend some one of your buddies' small groups and just get connected that way and um, get in a rhythm and have somebody uh, disciple you or kind of hold you accountable to your reading. Right. That's a big deal. That's really helped Ian in college is uh, one of his guys at Capstone Church down there really mentored him and discipled him and held him accountable and they, they would meet and so forth. And that really made him grow really uh, big time. So, yeah, that's good stuff. I think accountability partners is huge. It's huge. You know, having people with you because yes. it's, it's hard to do it by yourself alone. It is. And it's a, it's a, you know, being a Christian is not for rookies, man. It's, 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 not. it's uh, the devil's working all the time. He never stops. Um, and so you constantly need, need the Lord to lift you up and um, know that he's with you and, um, know everything's going to be all right. Yeah, um, but he has overcome the world. You know, God has overcome right. the world. And so I think we have hope in that. Even people that struggle with things, mm-hmm. um, you know, God's overcome the world. And right. so so you can have victory in that. I think that's, that's the thing. A lot of people and a lot of preachers say, you know, if you come to Christ, everything's going to be easy. But it's almost the, the opposite. opposite because then yeah. you have another enemy in, in Satan, you know, that's against you. Right. So it's, uh, it is tough, though. But God's with you through those times. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so you talked about your marriage a little bit. Uh, how did you meet your wife? And uh, I want to talk about all that and get into the nitty gritty. Oh, my Lord. Uh, nothing too crazy, hopefully. But uh, And two, dating back then versus now, you, we can kind of play off each other on that because now oh, yeah. dating, man, is something else. Dating apps and all that, it's a lot. But anyway, how did you meet your wife and how did all that start? It's, it's funny. I, I moved back to Alabama. Um I lived in Tulsa for a while, worked for a, a big, large mortgage corporation out there and, mm-hmm. and moved back here and uh, worked at a bank. And Debbie was, uh, she was a flight attendant and left that. She was stationed in LaGuardia, New York, and that was terrible. And so she had a marketing degree and couldn't do anything with it. So she came back and went to nursing school, became a nurse. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, but while she was going to nursing school, she worked at a little um, formal a uh, rental company, formal wear place at the mall. And uh, so see, she would come into the bank that I worked at and make deposits. And, uh, and we kind of eyed each other a little bit. And, and this is really pretty amazing is I was her parents' paper boy when I was a kid. Now I'm, I was, a, I'm four years older than her. So I would have never known her in school. Right? right. So we lived around the corner from each other. I mean, I could throw a rock and hit her parents' house. Wow. Um, and so anyway, she knew me, but I didn't know her. And so she was the aggressor there and mentioned to the ladies at the bank that she, you know, asked questions about me and stuff. So I got, I got my interest up. So they told me to go and, uh, to where she worked and made her whatever. So I did. And, uh, and that, that's just how we met. And we just, I mean, we dated for two or three months and got engaged and got married six months later, man. Wow. And it's just been amazing. 34 year ride, man, for me, it's just been wonderful. That's awesome. Um, she's a wonderful, godly girl, but she uh, worked in operating room for, I don't know, 15 or so years at uh, the hospital and, mm-hmm. and then um, stayed, stayed home taking care of kids. But we've had a wonderful ride, man. It's been great. That's awesome. So marriage, you would recommend it to, Heck to people. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's the best. Yeah. I think if you find the right person, man, that's, that's God's gift to us as women, man, for it sure. It is. 
It is for sure. For sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you said that your your wife stayed home with the children. Was that kind of a joint decision? Was that something that was really yeah, important yeah. to you? Or, or yeah, it, it was at the time. Um, it was where we we could. I got more um, established in my my career, and mm-hmm. so we were able to do that. Just let her drop off, and and I just worked, and she would. Uh, so now, um, she um, she's executive officer for the Home Builders Association of Alabama, and mm-hmm. Um, but that's a teeny tiny little job works a few hours a month or whatever, but she really helps me take care of my 92 year old mother. So, okay. And that's where when you get my age, your caregivers for your parents. And it just is what it is. Well, the people have went, I think it swung back and forth to the, the pendulum of should my wife stay home and take care of the children? Should she work? You know, some women have ideas on that. Would you say it was very important or how impactful do you think it was with your wife staying at home with the kids? Oh, it was important. Yeah. Uh, it was very important. Um, gosh, um, the kid got quality everything. He was, right. you know, went to, um, went to a Christian school and, and did well. Um, had a lot of support every day. Mm-hmm. And so it was wonderful. It was, it was really good for him. Well, mainly the influence, I think, with parents, you know, I, I don't have kids yet, but dropping off my child you know, to be with somebody else all the time versus being able to be with either me or my future wife. I think Mm -hmm. I just see that as a priority. That's just me, but you have to do what you have to do. We didn't talk really about uh, retirement that much, Mm. but do you have ideas on retirement? I do. Uh, So, so tell me a little bit about what you think about retirement as a whole. Well, there's two words that are not in the Bible and that is retirement and vacation. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty good. All right. So, you know, I work at a bank. I, I go in at six o'clock every day. Um, yeah. and I'm there cause I get up early, I, but I like to work. I don't have any ambition to retire. I'm 65. Mm-hmm. I'm going to work as long as I got a brain and my body will let me. That's awesome. Um, but, and as long as I got something to give and I, and I, I will recognize when I don't. Yeah. Um, I will recognize when, uh, the technology and of it, of what I do has surpassed me. I'll, I'll know that. I'm, and I'm mentoring some people now to take my spot at, at a, as far as management in a, in a short period of time. And, but I would like to stay on and, and, and just work maybe a little less hours in that, but mm-hmm. I still want to work. And I, I don't want to, I feel like I just see, um, I love old men. I just love them. And mm-hmm. I see people out in public, uh, walking or approaching older people and they just look right through them. They, they could care less. I mean, they're talking, they're thinking about their kid there and this and that and the other. And I just think I don't want to lose my identity because everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people know who I am because of what I do. Yeah. And I want to, I want to be out there as a person. I don't want to retire too early and lose my identity and just be another face in the crowd. Mm-hmm. You know, and that happens so often. I just don't want to be that guy. And so maybe that's vain. I don't know, but that's just how I feel about it. Yeah, I can understand that. But mm-hmm. I think, too, you've built a very successful, uh, you know, income business, all that, you know, the way you've been doing things. I think it's, it's, it is hard to let go. I think sometimes if you work, it, it is. To, you know. It is. Mm-hmm. It is. And, and, you know, life's been, been good to him, been very blessed. I, I just, um, but I just, you know, I, my brother, travels nonstop he's retired and he's living large and oh, so wow. forth but you know i'm just content here in gadrock man i love it here mm-hmm. um, we travel two or three big trips a year but i like be, i like coming home and cranking up a fire pit and cooking some meat on the grill you know right. god loves a good rama he loves That's a good right. cookout man he just loves it and so um I don't have to have something before me all the time. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, a lot of people now it's all about, you know, we talked about appearances, social media and Mm -hmm. all that, but if you're content with what you're doing, what's wrong with that? As long as it's not hurting other people, as long as you're happy, what's wrong with that? That's right. You know, I'm with you. Um, I think that's a great thing though, but I think your identity, you know, I always tell people, which I'm 31, but if you retire, you need to have something to do from a medical standpoint. I've seen people retire, right? uh, Go and sit, and not do anything and waste right. away. I and mean, you're literally going to waste away. You need to have and some sort of mission. they still have something to, to give, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But so. I think um, 
you know, some type of mission in your life, feeling productive in some way, giving in some way. Yeah, and you can give back because we're just we live in a United States. We live in this town here, and never and you know, if you want to work, you can be successful. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's good later in life, later years, like my age and older. It's good to give back and and uh, do nonprofit work and that. It's good stuff. Yeah, you said it's very rewarding. Yeah, you said two or three times were uh, plenty of work and all that. This younger generation, man, not wanting to work, it's, it's something else. That was not instilled in me by my dad. It's like you work, you provide for yourself, mm -hmm. you do all that. I just, I really can't comprehend. Now getting a degree, everybody's getting them. But the ticket is to get it with a, as close as you can to a 4.0 because that's what everybody wants when you go to apply for jobs. And, that. Sure. and I think a lot of times kids are not as, I'm not saying my kids anybody special, but a lot of, a lot of kids are not as dedicated to the, putting in the hard work to get the 4.0s and that kind of stuff. And then, then things happen in college. I've been in college and I know how, I know what goes on there and yeah. so forth. But yeah, well, we talked about participation trophies, I think off camera, uh, I don't know, but yeah, but that was my generation. And so you have all this winning with no effort. That's right. And, and, and failure is such a good motivator. Oh my it, it is the best and it's necessary. Um, and you've seen that in a lot of the, the younger generations. There's no failure. They they are almost entitled. They're entitled. They are. Yeah. They're giving these. They used to give trophies. Now they give them a ring. Oh, my really? youngest my <laughs> youngest grandson plays baseball. They give them a ring and stuff and whatever. But um, I get it. I think there's a time I mean, for I do. joy. I do get there, it. there used to be happiness, but too, um, I think in my life specifically too, the failures that I've had make me enjoy the good moments and make me appreciate what I have because I've yes. had to go through so much. Yes. When you work hard and you overcome obstacles to get to achieve a goal, it's so much more rewarding right. than just going through. I mean, it's like going to the gym and working out. If you don't push yourself and make your muscles hurt to work out, you're not doing any good. Just lifting a comfortable weight or whatever. It's right. just the sacrifice is where the, where the reward comes. And I talked about that before the gym. I started in high school. It really kind of shaped my mind to say, okay, I can work hard at something. Mm -hmm. I can be consistent and then I'm going to have results. Mm -hmm. And I think that I don't think I would be who I am today without it. I really don't. Uh, the gym has really transformed me. You're almost busting out of that shirt there. So you work out apparently. I do. I do work <laughs> out. I'm not busting out of this shirt, but I, I, yeah. So tell um, me about the gym for you. Is that just something casually you went into? How did no. you start really working out? Or well, I ride um, vintage dirt bikes or race vintage motocross. Right? Okay. And so you have to stay physically pretty fit to do it because it's pretty brutal. Yeah. Um, and if you fall occasionally, I've had some pretty s severe accidents, but uh, just having, I try to keep my back and shoulders and my arms really tuned up and tough, but. I'm doing it for that reason and doing my cardio just to, to, to do well on that bike. Sure. And I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that guy with the tire around his waist either. I mean, I just don't want to be that guy, but it's mainly, um, I'm just trying to stay, I'm not trying to bodybuild or anything. I'm just trying to stay in tune so I can ride my bike. That's great. And yeah. your age too. That's a great yeah, thing yeah. for sure. The resistance training from a medical standpoint, improving, uh, bone density, all that is important. Oh yeah. 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 So do you still do the dirt bike stuff? Yeah. I ran a race a couple of weeks ago wow. in Montgomery. And, and almost uh, 65 years old, man. That's, that's a, awesome. I'm riding with a bunch of old guys. So they're, yeah, that's they're cool. Though. 60 plus class and a 70 plus class and 50s plus class. So it's mm, fun. That's yep. awesome, man. Well, we're about to wrap it up. It's been a great talk, oh, I think, especially the financial and stuff. Oh, I think good. a lot of people are going to get stuff for that. Uh, I end with this 5, 10, 20 year plan. I know you're almost 65, but I want to go with this five years from now. Where do you see yourself at? Five years from now, I see myself pretty close to where I am now. I'm hoping not to touch any of my retirement assets. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm fortunate to have my home paid for. And and uh, so I'm just want to live. I want to work and uh, do my thing and just keep my assets for if I, you know, <laughs> my mom's 92 years old and all her mm -hmm. brothers and sisters live to be older. And so the chances of me living a long time are great. Right. So I have long-term care insurance in my portfolio as well so that when I uh, get to where I can't care for myself, I don't have to lean on my wife as much. I've got somebody to come into my house and help lift me out of a chair or help take me to a shower or to the bathroom or whatever and not put a burden on my children. So that I put, invested in that when I was 50 years old mm -hmm. and I've been, and I still am today. So I've, I've got a good pot there. So 
uh, it will help me financially where I won't touch any of my liquid assets. Um, I'm going to rely on that to pay for all the care that I need at that time. And I can even take that with me to the assisted living or nursing home or whatever. Right. And just let, you know, I don't want, I just don't want to pull my family and my kids down on, on me when I right. can do that. And the same for my wife. We both do that. That was a, that was a big part of our portfolio is that. And like right now today, my mother's 92 years old and she's living in a, a, a apartment. <clears throat> it's really like assisted living, but it isn't. But uh, I have a sitter that stays with her 12 hours a day. Now she's got somebody to be a companion. I can't be there with her all the time. My wife can't, but she's got somebody with her that cares for her all day. They help her get it to the shower. They take her to mm-hmm. eat her meals and so forth. And that's huge. I mean, her quality of life at 92 years old is good considering her body's broken. I right. mean, her, her body's just crap. Well, I would say a lot of people don't even think about that. Their parents are getting older and stuff yeah. like that. The, you know, it's, it, it, people say it's a burden, but it is. It can be. Uh, even if you love somebody, something can be it a is. burden to you. and it stuff Because you still have to provide and make money, keep yourself and your wife, oh, all that. It's, listen, it's a seen, lot. You know, me, myself, have had bad thoughts. And I've, I know people that have to take care of their, um, just because of the, who, the age that I am. Right. I see people taking care of their parents. And they get really aggravated. It gets into their time. and right. Pulls them away from doing stuff with their family and traveling and so forth. And uh, But, you know, we're supposed to take care of the poor and the needy and the elderly right and our and our parents and so god really likes that mm-hmm. and he rewards us for doing that he does he blesses us um uh, in lots of ways but um any rate uh my five-year plan is is just kind of be where i'm at i'm just i've got i'm putting back uh savings and, and i'm carrying on keeping building my portfolio 10 years I'm, i'll be leaning on it mm-hmm. i won't be working at all. And I'll be leaning on that uh, money that I've put back. I, I work, I've had to put in 401k. I don't get a retirement. So all the money that I'm, I'm uh, going to be paying myself, I earned it and mm-hmm. my wife. So I'm very, I'm going to be very good steward of that. Right. right. So, um, and even when I'm not working on tie the church, just like nothing ever happened, but plan to work five years, not in 10 years. And then hopefully in 20 years, I'll be in with Jesus. <laughs> That'd be awesome. That'd Maybe be awesome. not. You still got a lot of work to do, I'm sure. Yeah, at that well, point. we'll see. Made me think of a story um, about life insurance. We didn't really talk about life insurance much, mm-hmm. uh, term versus whole life and all that. But I, I know a story of a 40 something year old man, had a wife, three or four kids, passed away suddenly, had house, debt, mm-hmm. no life insurance, oh, none. That's and terrible. so that's something. Mm-hmm. I mean, they sell life insurance on that point, but I think mm-hmm. men is very, very important. Um, once you start working, mm. once you accumulate debt, yep. you need some kind of life. Ins- well, when you have a family, if you're by yourself, it yes. really doesn't matter as much. But when you get married, you need some kind of life insurance to cover all that stuff. You do. Man, t- term life insurance is so cheap. Yes. When I got, you're young, especially. I I forget how old. I was 38 years old. I bought a, a, a half a million dollar um, term policy. I want to say it was like $60 a month or something. Mm-hmm. It was a 30 year policy. I still have it. Wow. I've got maybe six years left on it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I was able to pay a low premium. I, I bought three or four of those. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but what that's allowed me to do is have a low premium to cover, you know, an accidental death or some kind, any kind of death I would have. Right. Take care of my spouse and my family easily. But in the same time, I'm able to put more into my 401k, my mm-hmm. retirement plan. So I'm not much on whole life. I did do that when I was younger, and I realized I probably should have been more in tune to uh, getting with a good financial guy. And, so and do you still have some of that whole life policy now? I don't have any whole life now. Okay. All, all I have now is, and really your insurance should just get you through to retirement, and you and, and you you have your four hundred one k. You're riding, you're riding on your or your investments, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I think term life's the way to go. But oh, yeah. when you get married, have kids, you got to think about all this stuff, man, the responsibility of that. What happens if, if you pass away? You know, you oh, now know. have a responsibility yep. and you need to take care of that. Yep. And that's something that a lot of employers now are doing that they didn't used to is they're giving $50,000 or $100,000 life policies for their employees, depending on where they are and what they do and so forth. Mm-hmm. And that's a big deal. That's a, that's a great compensation. Um, 
in a package for employment. So, people but based are, upon you know what, what we talked about, how much houses mm-hmm. cost, how much cars. I mean, a mm. hundred thousand. You know, that's not going to be very much. No, I'm know. just saying that that'd be enough. It's better to, than nothing. That'd put you in the ground and right and get your spouse to a point where she could maybe regroup. make decisions and but, all that. But, you know, having a, I mean, you need a million dollar policy minimum for any, if you've got any I mean, kind I of family. It's like 15, 20 bucks. I mean, it wasn't hardly anything it's monthly. No, I mean, but it's, but it's just a commitment. You got to do it. Yeah. I mean, you got to do it. Yeah. Well, you got to think about that long term. I think I talked about men being leaders. That's the major responsibility. You have That's a responsibility right. to your family. You got to take care of them even after you're gone. That's you may have to give it. up that one golf game or give up a latte yeah. or two during the week it's or tough. whatever. Those right? lattes, man. <laughs> got to have them. Got to have them. Well, dude, this has been absolutely amazing. Oh, I think good. one of the most informative episodes I think we've had, and I think financially um, it's going to help a lot of people. A lot of people, especially even my age, they don't know about retirement. They don't even know about their house, what an interest rate. They mm-hmm. just bought it, whatever else. You mm-hmm. know, They don't even know. So I think... Us doing this, being able to educate people my age and younger, has been great, man. Well, good. I'm glad. Thank I you for coming myself. in. Thank Absolutely. You. It was awesome. Thank you. That's it, guys. Thank you so much for watching the podcast, The Better Man with Dr. Jared Nelson. That's me. <laughs> Follow us on YouTube. We are on YouTube. Like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell. You're going to get all my episodes directly to you. We're on all the audio podcasts. We're everywhere. Apple Music, Amazon Music, Spotify. We're on every single one of them. Give us a five-star rating because we give five-star service. Thanks for watching. Right. Until the next one. Peace. What you, what'd you think of that, man? That's great. That's it was, great. It was awesome. And see, you're going to get to talk to uh, all these different varieties of people. Doing exactly. Things, and that, that'll be good for people. Well, that's the point. See, you being 64, 31, there's such a big gap, but you just have so much more life experience. And you can just, you know, talk to people about a lot I know I got things. kind of off the page. But... It was perfect. No, no, this is perfect. Oh, good. Yeah, it was absolutely perfect.